I'll start off the same way I sort of started off the other day. Um, actually, let's start off with introductions because I just feel like that's that's an important part. I am. My name is Lyle Thompson. My Ongohoe name, traditional given name, is Dehasenunde. It means he's flying over us. I am Hot Clan from the Onondaga Nation, which um, is <clears throat> most of our tribes made up of six nations: the Onondagas. Kiugas, Senecas, Oneidas, Mohawks, and Tuscaroras. And our tribes extend from like the Northern New York, upstate New York, into Canada, around the Toronto area. Um, so go ahead. All right, <clears throat> Richard Sneed, Principal Chief, Eastern Brown of Cherokee Indians. Uga Wiyu, Uwenai, Dikti, Dagwado'a. The uh, Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians uh, are the ancestors of uh, those Cherokees who resisted removal during the uh, uh, Indian Removal Act and the subsequent Trail of Tears. Um, we have about 16,000 tribal members uh, here in Western North Carolina, uh, about 56,000 acres. And uh, yeah, it's just an honor to be here and talk to you. Yeah, looking forward to it. So every year, I do want to go into that a little bit more, but every year, we, we do our Native American Heritage Night for the Georgia Swarm. And it's, it's sort of a special night for me um, because it allows me to, it's something I'm passionate about is, is just sharing the history of, of who I am, where my ancestors came from, what has made me, me. But I also get to do it from playing, do it by playing lacrosse, um, share the game of lacrosse, which is really tied into the Haudenosaunee people and for, for the most part, a lot of our our people. So let's sort of talk about the differences um, and talk about, I know for Cherokee people, you guys play stickball. Um, talk about the differences from the traditional, um, I guess, modern game we're seeing today, in, which is most similar to, to my people's game, the Haudenosaunee people. Um, I guess it, if you're comparing the sticks and whatnot and the style of play. Sort of talk, and talk about what the stickball game is, what it is to, to the Cherokee people, and, and how it's a medicine game for you guys. So for, for Cherokees, you know, stickball was uh, uh, not just for, for sport, uh, but a uh, means of settling disputes. You know, and, and the Cherokee name for it actually translates little brother of war. And uh, it's, uh, you know, there are stories of, of games going on for days, you know, to settle disputes. Um, we play now uh, annually at the fall festival and we have uh, community community teams and community games. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot more uh, physical than uh, a standard lacrosse game. So uh, it's, it's not uncommon for, uh, you know, for people to, uh, to get injured and, and get hurt. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's pretty, it's pretty rough, but I mean, at the end, you know, there's the, the spiritual aspect of it. Um, you know, there's, uh, uh, getting medicine before the game for strength, uh, keeping oneself pure before the game, and then after the game, going to going to water and to cleanse, and everything that happened on the field stays on the field, uh, and, and it's settled, it's done. Uh, the the difference now too is that there's there's more of a because the teams that that exist in Cherokee now are um, um, they represent their their communities. We do have one team that's uh, the Hummingbirds, you know, and they're they're um, a conglomeration of players from from all over the uh, the reservation. But the rest of the teams represent their their respective communities. So there's a lot of community pride. Um, you see communities that, like when I play, I usually play with Big Cove, even though I'm from Birdtown. But Big Cove doesn't or uh, Birdtown uh, doesn't have an over 40 team. So I play with Big Cove on their over 40 team. And uh, it's really uh, it's really great to see uh, like the the women uh, participating, you know, and standing. Uh, I guess you know, in sports terms, we would say kind of in the end zone, you know, standing there uh, in support of the men out there playing. Um, and there's just a lot of community pride associated with it. Yeah, and yeah. is that as far as how you how you're bringing the names to the teams? Is that how you guys are naming each community, or how does that how is that like the you said you played for Big Cove, or? Yeah, so the Big Cove community in Cherokee, Kolano Yi, uh, it's uh, the place of the raven. Uh, and, and that's, uh, 
it's, it's kind of a remote community because there's only one way in and one way out and it, it goes for about 10 miles just you know and then there's a loop and you can turn around and come back and that's it so the joke when, when we were kids and when i first came back to live on the reservation with my father the joke was uh don't go to big cove and i said why not and i said they still got dinosaurs up there so you got to be careful <laughs> so it's, it's a remote community yeah um paint a picture for us paint a picture for like what is it what does it look like as far as a game being played like if if someone who has never seen a medicine game being played, a stickball game being played, paint a picture for the listener who's like, you know, it's my first time seeing it, what does it look like? Sure, so you, there's a, you know, obviously a large open field and there's uh, two saplings that are stuck in the ground uh, at, at opposite ends of the field, uh, probably about 10 feet apart, I'd say. And uh, depending on who, uh, whose rules you're playing by, you either uh, you take the ball through and it's a score, or you do what's called in through in, in through the out. You go in through the saplings and you have to come back around. When the game starts, uh, usually it's usually it's 12 on 12. Although I've seen them line up more than that. Um, it's a good problem to have now. We have so many young men, and that's really great to see too. You've got we've got little kids playing. We've, we have a uh, you know they have uh, little kids and then uh, kind of like six, seven, like uh, seventh graders, like middle schoolers. And then there's the, the men's and then there's the old guy team that I play on, but um, uh, they'll, they'll line up. You have drivers, the drivers have long saplings in their hand and they're essentially like the referees. And there's one for each team and they'll, uh, they'll match up the players. And so they'll, uh, based on size, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll point to you and they'll, you come standing there, you're lined up in two lines facing each other and you lay your stick down facing your opponent's stick. And then once everybody's matched up, uh, then everybody picks up their sticks. And uh, well, before that happens, before the, the matching up happens, there's the, uh, it is after the, the challenge call. So uh, right before the game starts, uh, one, one team will issue the challenge call. And, uh, and then the other team, then they begin to walk forward. And then once they end their challenge call, the other team gives their challenge call. They begin to walk forward. You do this until you come and meet in the middle. Uh, then there's essentially like um, you know, like in lacrosse where you guys do where, where the ball down on the ground. Yeah. Yes, there's kind of the, the face off there. They throw the ball up. So it's like a, it's more like in basketball, you know, where you're doing the, the tip off, but you're doing it with your sticks. And then uh, from there, uh, what I've seen happen over the years is now there's a lot more strategy. When I, when I was uh, in high school and we played, it was just rough. I mean, it was just like a beat down. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a whole it, it didn't seem to be a whole lot of strategy to it it was kind of like uh kill the guy with the ball you know uh, and now there's a lot more strategy to the game and um i had the the honor last uh november i was uh, down in mississippi at choctaw uh, choctaw nation mississippi down at choctaw and got to watch uh, uh their their game played and it's much more like lacrosse it's a lot faster a lot more passing and i see that kind of working into how we play here, but it's still, it's, there's still that just brutal smash mouth aspect yeah. of the game here that I haven't seen any place else. Cause Cherokee nation is more, it's more like lacrosse. It's, it's less, uh, it's less violent. There's I mean, there's no, there's no, no nice way to put it. It is violent. Uh, especially like the men's game, it gets violent. Um, the, uh, the boys and, and the middle schoolers, not so much. And the older guys, not so much because we're older and more fragile, <laughs> but uh, when, when the when the teams are playing, representing their community, it it is uh, it is serious. It's serious business. So. And that's that's very real similar to us as far as um, we all play with one, all ages together. And the way we separate our teams is um, men versus boys. And you're considered a man once you once you have a child. So you can be sort of a younger man, but um, you do see that same similarity where. Those rough ones are, are that we call them the workhorses. They're right in the middle because the, the older people, um, in a way, obviously they're, because we have people like Orrin Lyons playing who's, who's, he might be 90 years old, but some people just feel out there to, to absorb it all, absorb that energy, that medicine. Same with those boys. They're, they're looking at those workhorses and like, you know, I'm gonna, I wanna be that way. You know, it's sort of a model, the harder you play, the stronger the medicine in our community 
And what's fascinating to me is how similar these, how similar but different. Like, like you just talked about, you painted that picture and it's different in so many ways, but the concepts are the same. The reasons you play the game and all those little things like tossing the ball up and cleansing after that, after the, the match to, to sort of purify your mind and, and let that be a lesson because I, I see that in, in what the game has taught me and all my lessons through playing lacrosse have been through taught in those medicine games. They're, they've been able to be transferred through, I guess, our culture because they're so intertwined. And I think sports do that. Sports overall do a really good job of uh, building character within our youth and keeping our youth in a path. So I guess to segue into what I want to talk about next, because I, I go down to uh, Cherokee Nation every, we do our annual swarm TBL camp down there. And what I see is a lot of athletes. There's so many athletes down there and you can tell these kids are playing different games. They're building athletic abilities through football, basketball. I see them shooting around with basketball and dribbling and just all around athletes. And I guess from your point of view, why do you think, why do you think sports are so important to our people and, and how can it really help us in, in the times come? Well, I think that, you know, historically, if you look at, uh, let's just talk about being tribal to begin with, right? There's, there's always uh, this sense of community that exists uh, that's it's difficult to find in other places. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that contribute to that, uh, obviously just uh, our history as people, but also um, there's, a, there's a commonality when it comes to shared suffering. Um, and then when I think about sports, you know, uh, like here locally, uh, we have uh, the reservation, Cherokee, and I think you guys went to Snowbird too, didn't you? like yep. down in Grant yep. County. So, you know, you traveled and that's like 50, 60 miles, about 50 miles away from Cherokee. And there's a, this little pocket down there of, of Cherokees. And um, I asked, uh, they, I, they do really good in, in football. Like they, they've got, I think this year, they won uh, their 14th state 1A football championship, which is unheard of, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and they're really good at a lot of different sports. And I and I asked uh, Chairman Wachacha, our Tribal Council Chairman, he's from down there. Uh, when I first came into office, I said, "How is it that you guys are so good, you know, at, at sports?" I mean, he just looked at me and he goes, "We don't have anything else, you know. There's like there's nothing else down there." So, <laughs> yeah, and, and I I think that's that's uh, that's that's pretty common uh, as far as reservation life goes, right? There's it's different for us now because where we have. Uh, we have a gaming enterprise, two gaming er enterprises, and we have resources. But I remember when I was growing up, and, and I was never really that good at sports. Uh, I'm still not very good at sports. But, um, you know, th that's like everybody's focus here because there was really not a lot else to do, but it was the one way that the community could always come together. Uh, softball tournaments, uh, basketball tournaments, stickball football. I mean, there was, that was always a way for the community to come together. And I think the other part of it, and this is just kind of my observation over the years, is that when, when a community, when, when, when a people has been oppressed, uh, it's like our athletes are like our champion, you know, and, and they, they represent us. And, and when they win, we win, you know, and, and, uh, I think that's why sports are so important in, uh, in Indian country. Yeah, I, I never actually kind of sort I never looked at it that way. And, and that is true. Like when when there's a superstar native athlete, it's it's loud and they make noise because the whole not just your community gets around, gets gets behind them. It's it's everybody. Um, and I felt that through a lot of the support I have and a lot of the followers I have through social media is within within native country. You know, I'm, I'm proud. I'm, I'm proud of who I am and I'm proud of all the, I'm honored that all the people are sort of behind me and um, I'm proud to represent. Whenever I think about what I'm doing, I always look back to, to how, how I'm showing the next generation of, of our athletes because for, for a lot of the case, um, you know, we, they, could, they could use some of the help. I know I could have and I look to a lot of people growing up um, 
And another thing sports really does is, you know, health, health, it's, it's, it's helping us in a way overcome, I guess, our health crisis. You know, we got high rates in, in obesity and diabetes and heart disease and um, sports kind of a, a pathfinder. That's what it's done for, for me in a way. I never went down that other, other road, but also the, the last point I, I guess I want to make is leadership. Um, I've been able to see so many leaders through the game of lacrosse from playing for some of my captains to coaches to elders in my community. So I guess talk about what it means to be a leader for you personally and in being a tribal chief, um, what are the things you want to you wanna do as a leader and what are some of those characteristics? Well, I do. I actually do a lot of talks on leadership. Uh, I'm always very honored to do that. That that uh, when I get asked by uh, you know our, our local uh, uh, gaming enterprise, you know they have a leadership development team, and they ask me to come and speak on leadership. And I've been asked by some of the local universities to come speak on leadership. And you know I always lead with uh, leadership. Rule number one is, is servanthood. Right. It's never, it's never about you as, as like, it's never about me. Leadership is always about everybody else. It's always about understanding that there's a, it's a huge responsibility that, that uh, it's about caring for the people that you have uh, responsibility for. And, and that's the way I've always seen it. I've never seen it as uh, I'm in charge, right? It's never, I'm up here and, and everybody else is down here. It's, it's actually, you know, I'm responsible for, for, all of these people that, that I have, you know, uh, authority in their lives. And so, um, but also I do a lot of talks about leadership at every level. And we're seeing that right now all around us, right? With, with everything that's happening uh, since the, the George, George Floyd uh, murder and all of the protests, we're seeing leadership at every level. Um, I, I always want people to understand that leadership is not something that one day just happens to you, right? It's one of those things that for me, my experience has been when I talk to other leaders as well, that, that you just grow into that that when you start to take chances because there's you know when you take risk um so for example there's a, and again this is a perfect example of what we're seeing play out around us um somebody the, whoever shot the video and the people who were pleading with those police to you know let this man up that was leadership in action right they could have stood by and done nothing they could have kept on walking but they, they involve themselves in it. That's an act of leadership. And because yeah. of their act of leadership, this has gone worldwide now, right? Everybody now that like, this just can't be ignored any, any longer. So because of that act of leadership, and we, I don't even know who, who was behind the camera. No idea who was behind the camera, but look what it's done. It's it sparked this, this worldwide uh, outrage and, and action. And so leadership is, is uh, doing things that may, may not always be popular. Like uh, I, re I remember from a very young age making decisions uh, when I was amongst my peers and where I would step outside of the group and say, no, I'm not gonna do that or no, I'm not gonna participate in that. Or, um, you know, it's, it's, it's having the courage to, to, to stand uh, for others who, who maybe can't stand for themselves, to defend the defenseless. All those things are a part of it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, uh, it's always a, a servant position. It's always placing others' needs before your own. Um, and then I think if you have that heart uh, and you keep that at the, at the forefront of your decision-making, uh, then you'll be successful as a leader. Not that you won't make mistakes, not that you won't get it wrong sometimes, but if it, it always comes back to the motivation of the heart, right? And the motivation of the heart is not, what can I get out of this? How's this gonna benefit me? The, the motivation of my heart is, is always, what's in the best interest of my people? And not just right now, like how is this going to affect my people five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and on down the road? Um, because every decision we make, and this is another thing with like with COVID, uh, you know, I meet with my leadership team, and that's the other thing about being a good leader is you got to surround yourself with good people, um, with people who will hold you accountable. Uh, you can't surround yourself with people who are just going to be yes people you know, and pat you on the back and tell you how great you are and, and you know, oh, everything you do is right. All your decisions are right. You don't need people like that. Like you need yeah. people who are going to challenge um, when, when you're wrong because you're going to be wrong sometimes, you know. So, um, but like with COVID, we've, we've learned that uh, the best laid plans, 
this is oh, it's a great plan. We'll work on a plan for, you know, all day long in a planning session on how we're going to deal with something. And we implement the plan. And then three or four days later, something happens that just totally jerks the rug out from underneath that plan. And then, we, you know, we're right back to square one. And we've got to come up with something new. So uh, being flexible. Um, but in all of it, it's, it's especially in this role, it's, it's uh, understanding that we're going to make decisions that are um, in the best interest of our people, trying to do the, the greatest good for the greater good, knowing full well that no matter what decision we make, there are going to be some negatives come out of it. Because there's no way you can make a decision that's going to impact 16,000 people and everything's going to go right for everybody. There's just no way. So, um, you know, when I think about our tribe, I, I, I had a meeting with one of our tribal elders today uh, at lunchtime. And uh, like my main purpose for getting into tribal, I hate to say tribal politics because I, I hate politics. Um, my, my purpose for trying to get into, for getting into tribal government in the first place was I saw this pattern of behavior that has existed since I was a kid. And it's just this broken system. Like we had, I, I remember getting the question one time, uh, what's the greatest challenge facing tribal leaders today? And I was on a panel up in D.C. and I said, to, uh, to answer that question or to understand the answer to that question, you first have to understand what was imposed upon tribal nations by the government of the United States. I said there were 500 plus nations that existed on this continent prior to European context with very complex social systems, religious systems, complex economic systems, social systems, all of that. And then Europeans came in and subjugated the people by force, right? And then um, they took the people and placed them on reservations, right? And essentially made them dependent upon the government. Especially if you, I think of it like if you were a Plains tribe and you were used to, you know, uh, following uh, the buffalo for your food source and, and for everything else, and then you're stuck on a reservation now, and, there's, and you have nothing, and now you're completely dependent upon the government. So that dependency uh, was imposed upon tribal people for 100 plus years. And then the federal government says, you know what, we're going to switch to self-governance now. Why don't, you, why don't you Indians go ahead and govern yourself? That sounds great in theory, but the reality is for a lot of tribes, anybody who knew anything about traditional tribal government had died already. And you had generations that had been raised in this pattern of behavior where you're essentially dependent all the time yeah so so tribes unfortunately we adopted this broken system it, where how, how, that, how, how do you kind of get it not yeah in, in a way get away from that and take lessons from you know oral traditions of stories of your your great 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 grandfathers and those leaders those how we used to operate when, when we were tribes, when we were, you know, centuries ago, how do you instill those, those characteristics of leaderships, but not just characteristics, the, the, the systems they use and how to operate a community and lead in that way? How, how do we really reinstill those? It's really complex because um, you have, first of all, we need tribal leaders. Like we, and I mean leaders, we need people who are willing to actually lead and, um, you know, one of the things I tell some of my fellow tribal leaders, I said, you know, sometimes the answer has to be no. Uh, we, we can't just all the time. Uh, it can't always, the can't, answer can't always be yes to every, every ask, every want, right, of, of the people. Um, so we have, to, we have to lead. We have to have people who understand that uh, the decision making uh, has to have a long term uh, outcome in mind and not just the right now or yeah, even worse uh, is this how is this going to affect me in the next election cycle got to get away from that thinking um, we need we need real leaders it, it requires uh, it requires family it requires the family to be a family uh, one of the, the the challenges that I I stated to our uh, my, my fellow leaders here in Cherokee I say uh, you know Gosh, you got to be mindful of the fact every time we create a tribal program to take care of a need, uh, and it may be a real need. Sometimes there are perceived needs and there are real needs, right? I said, but every time we, we make a program to deal with a need, 
that we used to do for one another, right? That we used to where, you know, uh, where we, we would take care of our, of the elders in our family, or, you know, we would uh, make sure that they had food or make sure they had shelter where we took care of one another. But now we create all these programs and then our people don't look to one another. I said, we're undermining community. We're undermining what it means to be tribal and replacing it with this mindset that the tribal government is going to do everything for me. So we've yeah. got to break away from that. Yeah. I, that's, I, a tough one, that's a tough one to get away from. Yeah. And, and I see that in sort of um, our, our system of leadership in, in my community, because the way, um, you know, our Confederacy elects their chiefs is, it is that family aspect in a way where, um, part, and there, there are there are unwritten rules. You don't have to follow them, but like, you know, a chief is supposed to have, um, you know, a family because it, it shows that sort of because it, kids teach you a lot. You know what I mean? Um, and and there's a lot of lessons there where um, it's never sort of too late, but there's a lot of lessons in a way where looking after the next generation. There's a lot in that. There's a lot of teachings in that. So I think that's, that's an important thing um, is sort of going back to the, the oral traditions and the teachings that we, that we once had in dissecting them, simplifying them so that everybody understands um, and everybody in a way can become their own leaders. And that's how you, that's how that community blossoms. It, it gets bigger and bigger with stronger and stronger people. Whereas when you talked about that oppression of our people, it was shrinking that it wasn't, it was doing the opposite of blossoming and we were shrinking as a people. That's why you see the, you know, environmental racism crushed us in a way. And also like the drug and alcohol abuse, because that was sort of instilled with, with a generation and it affected the next generation and the next generation. And I think we're at a point now where we're, we're getting really good leaders that are helping our communities and the next generation is only going to get better and better and better. And I think when you have people like yourself in office, um, it plays that difference. It plays, obviously you're not going to fix everything in, you know, a number of years, but you're setting up this domino effect that's going to help the generations to come. Absolutely. I agree. And, and, uh, you're absolutely right too. It's, it's, uh, Think about it like this, like, like it's the, the change never comes, sustained change never comes most of the time. I should say never. It's very rare that sustained change comes quickly. Sometimes in crisis, it does. Uh, but oftentimes, even in crisis, you'll see, you'll see change and you'll see the needle move more dramatically. Uh, but typically, change that's going to be sustained is incremental. It's just, it's, it's changing mindset. It's, uh, it's changing patterns of behavior. And your point you made about like substance abuse, you know, I've always said that substance abuse is, uh, isn't the root, uh, isn't the root cause, isn't, isn't the root problem. Uh, that, that's simply, it's a symptom, right? It's a symptom of, of uh, underlying pain and underlying uh, uh, generational trauma. That, that, that trauma gets passed on from generation to generation. And then people self-medicate from generation to generation those that root issue has to be dealt with right how do we how do we bring healing to people's hearts and minds so that they're not you know getting addicted so that they're not turning to that lifestyle to to ease the pain so uh and, and to your point uh there are more and more people i think who are becoming uh educated on these things and then uh I mean, you know you mentioned having i've got five kids they're all grown now they're all adults you know and, and um and I look back on it and there's all kinds of lessons that I learned being a father that changed me, you know, and they're, they're, each one of my kids are so different and uh, how I dealt with one didn't work with another one. And I had to change up my strategy and it taught me things about myself that needed to change in me, you know? So, um, but at, at the end of the day, um, it, it's going to require uh, all of us as, as, as individuals, as parents, as, as husbands and wives and, as tribal members uh, working together with a, a shared vision in mind, uh, you know, of, of uh, healing and, and, uh, and being able to uh, be a strong people. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think completely agree with that. 
Let's uh, to sort of finish off. Let's talk about the Georgia Swarm in the the Cherokee Nation. Correct me here. The Eastern Band. Explain that because I think that's also important. Is sure. is I know you touched on it at the beginning, and I want to go back to it because I didn't know, and I think if I don't know, you know, there's obviously a whole lot of other people that know. So explain sort of how how the Cherokee people split off and and where each resides, sort of go into detail about that. Okay. So you had um you had a you had a group of Cherokees uh when when all of this uh land grabbing was going on in the southeast uh in uh like the eighteen early eighteen thirties, late eighteen twenties and so forth, uh land grabs and, and Indian land being taken. Uh there were there was one group when when it looked like removal was was imminent. There was a group that that went ahead and left and and uh, headed west. Uh, ended up in Arkansas first, and then were ousted from there and ended up in Oklahoma. And the best way I can under, you know, share that is that 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 group would be their ancestors became the United Katua Band, the UKB Cherokee. And they reside in Oklahoma. And then you had. Uh, the Treaty of New Echota, which was um, was signed by you know several tribal leaders, and interestingly enough, on that one, you know, like we were always taught here when I was going to high school that you know they were the bad ones. They signed this treaty, they sold us out. But you know, when you when, as an adult, when I learned more, it's like actually they had exhausted every means they, they that they knew for a peaceful resolve, and their belief was was that if they didn't sign this treaty and and go ahead and go to Indian territory in Oklahoma, that we were going to be wiped out. You know, that it was going to end up in war, and that we would be wiped out. Um, so that group left on the Trail of Tears. That's those are the ancestors today that are Cherokee Nation in Oklahoma. Um, there was a final council session, and you can't see it, but it's on my wall over there. There was a final council session at Red Clay, Tennessee, um, right before the removal, and it was at that last council session that the my ancestors said we're not going we're staying here and they hid out in the mountains and stayed uh, and that became eastern band and so um, I, I pointed over there because there's a poster on the wall because in 1984 uh, there was a joint council session between uh, eastern cherokee and back then they called themselves western cherokee now now it's like the nation right but, but back then there was western cherokee so they had a joint council session my dad was a council member then and they, uh, they they did a joint council session at Red Clay, Tennessee in 1984. And that was the first time since the Trail of Tears that there had been a unified council. So Eastern Cherokees, uh, so Cherokee Nation is the largest, then uh, then Eastern Cher Eastern Band Cherokee, our tribe, and then UKB, which is a very small, small Cherokee, uh, small group of Cherokees. But UKB, that they probably, they're, they're most mostly full bloods a lot of cherokee speakers ukb where, where's, where's that? Where uh, they're in oklahoma as well they're they're right there in telequa uh with cherokee nation and uh as far as language in the eastern band are are you guys going well is it is it on the rise because i know in a lot of the communities because i travel a lot and speak in different communities um with with my brothers and our company and what I've a trend I'm starting to see and, and I'm really happy to see is are people picking up language that has almost been gone in, in my in the Onondaga nation um, there there is there's I want to say there's only like one or two first language speakers whereas on my father's side in the Mohawk nation you know both my grandparents their first language was Mohawk so it's nice to see sort of these communities across um, you know, Indian country really start to grow in that aspect, go back to that, those roots. So how is it in, in Eastern Band and how are you guys doing with, with the language? Well, I think what you're seeing across Indian country is that, uh, you know, our natives across the country are realizing that, uh, you know, one of the key uh, elements that sets us apart as a people is, is our unique language. And so um, Eastern Band, we have, just around 200 fluent speakers left. Uh, most of them are, are well advanced in age. 
So we're doing everything we can to, to preserve the language. We have our language immersion school that we've had for, I guess, about 10 years now. Um, uh, we've, we've got um, uh, adult language programs uh, that, that are started. We've got a program that we're going to be starting for our workforce. So we're doing all we can for, um, for preservation of language. Uh, it's tough, man. It's really difficult when, uh, you know, if you don't have somebody else to talk to, uh, it's, it's difficult yeah. to, to, to learn it. And also, too, it's essentially trying to learn uh, a lexicon, right? You're, you're essentially trying to memorize words for, you know, what does this mean? How do I say this? And then you have to memorize those. And the only way to do that is just through repetition and keep using them. So yeah. it's, it's a high priority for us. Uh, and, and a real challenge, but I, I'm sure we're going to be successful with it. Yeah, same, same. Here. And I guess like like the direction I was going, um, the Georgia Swarm in the Eastern Van Cherokee Nation Partnership, the Harris Cherokee Casino. Um, how important has that been? How 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 well has that partnership come together, and how important is it to to your community? How has it benefited? I think it goes back to you know, your comments earlier when we were talking about sports and why sports are important and how you and your brothers are role models, you know, and, uh, and I think why that's important here, just as it is when you travel around Indian country, uh, is that when, when a young person, you know, whether they're six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, whatever, um, and they see somebody who is like them uh, being successful, uh, that inspires them and that gives them hope and gives them uh, the belief in themselves that, well, if Lyle and his brothers can do it, that means I can do it too, right? There's, a, there's opportunity there. That means, uh, that means it, it's something we can, that, that's achievable. Uh, the reason to me the, the relationship is important is, is just what I talked about. It's like uh, when, uh, when we did the first uh, Native American Heritage Day down there, it was, it was pretty good as far as attendance goes from Cherokee. It was decent. Um, but last year, before before COVID, there were over a thousand people from Cherokee traveled from Western North Carolina, and they made the three-hour trip down to Atlanta to be there for Native American Heritage Day. And I think a big part of that is seeing you and your brothers out there playing a game that is so similar to our game. It's just there's just an immediate connection, and so it's yeah. really cool now. Like I'm traveling around, you know, I can be traveling around the community or. I can be, you know, 45 minutes away or something, and I'll see a car from Cherokee, and it's got a Georgia Swarm magnet on the back, you know. So, so it's like there's this uh, little pocket of fans up here in Western North Carolina who are, you know, all in with the Georgia Swarm. And then from a corporate perspective, you know, the the corporate sponsorship with our um, with our casino enterprises, because on the you know on the field, of course, you know, there's uh, on the one end it's uh, Cherokee Valley River, and on the other end it's Cherokee's Hair River Resort you know, on the, on the turf, uh, that means a lot to us when we see that. And then I don't know if it was your shot. Was it your shot that made sports center the over the shoulder? Was oh, that yeah. yours or was, it was miles. Yeah, it was miles over the shoulder. And it, it was, it made the, one of the top 10 plays on ESPN. And then there was our logo. So everybody was all, yeah. all worked up about that. That was really cool. So yeah. I'm sure that, unique. When, when the community sees that, it's like, I mean, it, it also draws them in, draws, I was just saying more. And the other part for, for me personally is going up there or down there every summer um, for, for our annual camp. It's been, I, it's been special because I've been, we've done it for this, this will be our fifth year and we're going to make it happen. But to go there and see the growth as far as the, the modernized game we're playing and these kids develop has over the years and, and obviously they're not surrounded by, by the game. Um, like I was, you know what I mean? I was, I was surrounded by my cousins and my whole community. So to me, it's shown me that one, they're still picking, picking their stick up. They're still grabbing a stick somewhere throughout this year. Um, so I want to be able to get there even more. And, um, I've been invited to the fall festival when you guys do that in like October or November. October. Yeah, a, a few times. So we've, we've grown a relationship with with your community members. And um, every year we bring down somebody new. My grandfather went down 
two years ago, my parents came down with us the other year and it's sort of been a tradition within my little family um, to head down there and sort of have this cultural exchange as you guys show us, you guys have a big meal for us, um, show us your traditional foods. And, and every year I, I look forward to, to that in this Native American heritage game. Well, last year when, uh, when you guys came and, and your dad came with you and uh, we had the honor of going out and having a nice meal together, uh, it was such an honor for me to sit at the end of the table with, uh, with your dad and with uh, John Arlotta and you and your brothers and, and uh, just, to, just to break bread and fellowship and, and share stories and to laugh. Uh, it, it was an immediate, it's always an immediate connection, you know, and that's one of the things that's really great about, uh, about tribal people is that when we get together, there's just a, just a connection right away. And uh, it, was, it was a real honor to meet your dad. He's, he's a great man. Yeah. And, um, you know, sort of, sort of close out. I think, you know, doing this, it's, it's, it'll be able to educate more people on your people, my people, the game of lacrosse, the history of us. And, and, you know, the special thing for me on Native American Heritage Month is, is just that. And I think, um, when we can educate more people, especially people in, in that, where we're playing the Atlanta area and to know, you know, the closest tribe, are you guys the closest tribe to the, to the Atlanta area? Uh, yes, we are actually. Yeah. I mean, so, so to be able to, cause you know, the, the, these people aren't learning about our people in history books. Um, Truth. we've all gone through the, our state's curriculum of, education and so you know we're not they're not learning these things through history books and, and they have to find it in other ways so i think that's another special part about native american heritage or our native american heritage game is that and you know maybe one day we'll be able to get you to to sort of speak to these people one-on-one -on -one with with me and my brothers and the other natives all on the team because i think it, it shows so much more um and allows to educate these people how close they are to to the check to the charity people and it'd be an honor to do it yeah yeah and not to mention every year we go up there um one of the other parts i always look forward to is you guys' golf course <laughs> you guys got a really nice golf course. you've been golfing at all no we're uh we're actually uh looking at building a big hotel there too so that's oh, going to be nice yeah so our, our, our goal, our, yeah, so our objective there is to, we want to have, uh, I mean, obviously, apart from our, our casino hotels, um, a destination that would rival uh, like uh, anything that you would see in, uh, uh, in Asheville, a really nice resort there. So we, it would, that's our objective with that. It's going to be, it's going to be a beautiful prop property when it's done. Yeah, the, course I mean, is the, not, the whole area is, is. It's an enjoyable drive. We, we drove down a few times um, just because we have, you know, a whole group of people coming with us. And the drive itself is special just because, you know, you, you got the mountains and, and a whole lot going on, a lot of good scenery. It's beautiful. Absolutely. It's one of the most beautiful places on earth. Yeah. Well, Chief Need, pleasure talking to you. Thanks for, for hopping on and redoing this. And I think this will help a lot of people and, and help educate a lot of people. And I appreciate everything you do inside your community and outside and you as a person, you know what I mean? Everything you talked about, especially the leadership, I, I'll be able to take and, and instill some of that stuff into my own life. Excellent. Thank you so much. It's always an honor to talk to you. Yeah, right. I'll see you. See you. I'll see you when we, when we head down. Excellent. All right, talk to you soon. Bye. Yeah, have a good one.